Is feminism going out of fashion? In June 2022, the New York Times' Michelle Goldberg wrote a piece entitled The Future Isn't Female Anymore about growing agreement that mainstream feminism had grown stale and somewhat embarrassing, that it failed to speak to the realities of many women's lives, and that it lacked a vision of a better world. We had the women's marches and the pink hats, and it meant a lot in terms of women turning out the vote. But I... I don't see that right now. This crisis in the feminism movement couldn't really come at a worse time for American women. There's the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, how the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately put women out of work, problems like workplace sexual harassment and unequal pay that aren't going away and maybe getting worse, and a Me Too backlash in full swing that's unleashed a torrent of shocking misogyny. Weirdest of all, there doesn't seem to be an organized political movement or even a coherent, relatable, popular feminist rhetoric to fight back. There is, I think, a feeling of exhaustion, despair, disillusionment right now that is incompatible with a lot of activism. So how did we get here when a mere six years ago, Me Too's cultural moment seemed to promise a new era? And is it possible to channel all these setbacks to reignite our passion for women's rights with a more meaningful feminist framework for our times? In some ways, it's impossible to deny recent years have seen progress in making feminism more mainstream. Far more women describe themselves as feminists than a couple decades ago. And post Me Too, there's at least more public scrutiny on men in power. Let's just say it's endemic. I spent my 20s trying to get old men's tongues out of my mouth, you know, because they were just thought, well, she's up for it. At the same time, though, we're in the midst of a growing, scary backlash to Me Too ideals. And more generally, many people, especially young ones, admit they find the available feminist rhetoric too performative, outrage-based, and often just cringe. For the man that's taking up too much space on a bus, on the plane, on the bench, we see you. You don't need that much room. Goldberg reported on a recent poll that found that not only young Republicans, but also a surprising number of young Democrats agreed with the statement that feminism has done more harm than good. Arguably, it's the mainstreaming of feminism that's led to some of today's problems. As feminism came into vogue and became exploitable in capitalist venues in the 2010s, we conflated consumerism with empowerment. Girl boss feminism highlighted the examples of high power individuals co-opting the girl power idea in service of only personal advancement without systemic change. And as many of those prominent girl bosses proved disappointing, this tarnished the public view of female empowerment in general. I'm malicious and I own it. Sorry, you own who I am, what I do, terrorizing my employees, and I'll never apologize. Meanwhile, it seemed like we'd all been too busy posturing on social media to pay attention to how our rights were in the process of being eroded and the concrete problems facing most women weren't being addressed. As the Drift magazine wrote, for a long time now, we've had the sense that feminism is in trouble. In the years before the pandemic, its most prominent battles were about figureheads. These days, symbols no longer seem adequate or even all that meaningful. As actual conditions for working women and mothers across America fail to improve and get worse, Drift writes that we're witnessing a profound malaise and what has felt like a course reversal over the past two years. There's an overriding sense of hopelessness. Women in heteronormative partnerships may still be complaining about impossible burdens falling on them, but they're giving up hope that the picture will truly change. Today's feminism crisis underscores that the movement of feminism can't be fully mainstream, palatable to everyone, or easily marketable. It must be radical in some ways, and it must be concrete about goals that substantially benefit the lives of most women. Feminism has been going in and out of fashion for decades. Jesus. Don't get her started on that femaleism stuff. Feminism. For most of feminism's early history, it was not trendy, but radical and confrontational. The women who organized for suffrage in the early 1900s were often represented as undesirable and bitterly anti-male. And half a century later, the women who fought for policies like the Equal Pay Act, Title IX, and the Equal Rights Amendment were routinely branded as angry, man-hating lesbians. These angry feminists, and I say angry feminists like there's some other kind, According to Gloria Steinem, her groundbreaking feminist magazine, Miss, founded in 1971, 
had a very hard time convincing companies and ad agencies that feminist readers were worth marketing to. Glamorous feminist figures like Steinem or Jermaine Greer did enjoy a moment of rising coal in the late 60s and 70s, but this in turn led to an anti-feminist backlash in the 80s before the 1990s saw feminism come back in a more mainstream way than ever with the rise of girl power. Girl power. The girl power concept actually started out as an alternative anti-capitalist niche. It was coined by Riot Girl band Bikini Kill in 1991 who saw consumer culture as a big part of the problem sidelining and silencing girls. But when girl power was co-opted by arguably the most mainstream band of the 90s, the Spice Girls, it became consumer culture. Uh, blah, 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 um, girl power, feminism, do you know what I mean? The Spice Girls' image of girl power celebrated positive things like friendship, individual empowerment, love, and peace. And their fans, girls and women, started to be valued as consumers to an unprecedented degree. But the girl power feminism of the 90s wasn't the kind of political, mission-driven feminism of the past. It was broader and vaguer. Any powerful woman was a positive symbol, regardless of her politics, her relationships with other women, or her beliefs about feminism. Do you think Margaret Thatcher had girl power? Yes, of course. Do you think she effectively utilized girl power by funneling money to illegal paramilitary death squads in Northern Ireland? Strong women became marketing tools, and the era's TV icons were what Afua Hirsch calls the superhuman women, starring in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Charmed, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and The X-Files. Then, feminism was out again. Girl Power 90s gave way to the post-feminist 2000s, and feminism was portrayed as something outdated, whose goals had been achieved, despite evidence to the contrary. Female celebrities began distancing themselves from the label. I'm not a feminist. I, I hail men. I love men. And it became common for women to say that they were humanists rather than feminists, backing away from the confrontational aspects of what it would take for women to get an equal playing field. Female-driven movies and television boasted about starring empowered women, but tended to ultimately center heterosexual marriage and traditional gender roles. How does it happen that four such smart women have nothing to talk about but boyfriends? Until the 2010s. As 70s and 90s style started to come back into fashion, feminism also returned. This time as a new, apolitical feminist brand with even more marketing power, the girl boss. I know that part of Waham's mission statement is lifting up every woman, but can you really do that if the price point is so inaccessible? Girl boss feminism, just like girl power before it, was not a political movement. Unlike being a true feminist, being a girl boss is about self progression, particularly financial, at the expense of other people. Girl bosses and girl power put a feminist veneer over the apolitical, or sometimes anti feminist, actions of wealthy, powerful capitalist women. Conflating their self serving ideals with feminism meant that the movement's original mission to elevate all women was lost. What's your favorite position, CEO. Many women were no longer united in a fight, but clawing their way to the top over other women. All of that needed to change. This pseudo-feminist, fantasy tween, chick lit bullshit is a devolution of the female mission. It's cancerous to the intelligence of young women. And in 2017, change did come with the Me Too movement. After Alyssa Milano popularized Tarana Burke's hashtag in response to allegations of sexual assault against Harvey Weinstein, it opened up an unprecedented dialogue around sexual violence in Hollywood and beyond. Not only did the campaign energize women to come together through sharing stories, but more importantly, it also advocated for specific solutions to specific consequences of sexism and patriarchy. And I can organize on the ground and, and talk to everyday people, the people who I connect with and work with, about how we keep elevating this conversation and what work has to happen. After two decades of girl power and girl bosses, the Me Too movement showed that mainstream feminism could be political. It could go beyond blandly saying women are great and start demanding concrete changes and accountability. But although Me Too was a departure from the empty mainstream feminism of the previous decades, that doesn't mean it was a long-term success. Few men were actually toppled from their positions of power or saw lasting consequences. And as a result of all the hype, in some ways, women began to be treated worse, with Forbes reporting that fewer women were being hired as a result of the movement. Women were more affected by COVID-19 job losses than men, with Hispanic women being hit the hardest. Women have been openly ridiculed and disrespected by our political leaders. Grab them by the <laughs> I can do anything. 
and much-needed policies to support working mothers through family leave and subsidized childcare have failed to go anywhere in Congress. Since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, 26 states have either totally banned, severely limited, or are in the process of attempting to ban abortion. And most of the lawmakers pursuing those bans have been clear that they don't intend to make exceptions for rape or incest. Eliza Gonzalez wrote for Drift, My mother's life is hard much harder than it needs to be. And when I take stock of feminism's current offerings, I see little that would actually ease it. I need a job to prove that I need daycare in order to get a job. Mainstream feminism has always been better at selling catchphrases than solving the problems of gender inequality, because frankly, it's a lot easier. Meanwhile, with the feeling of powerlessness for women who'd invested in this movement and not seen results came a tidal wave of burnout. A sort of professional class, lean-in style feminism doesn't speak to a generation that feels like the work world in general is a site of, yeah. of you know, hostility and oppression. As mainstream feminist rhetoric has failed to offer up real solutions to any of women's problems today, young Americans across the political spectrum have lost faith in it. Countless feminist publications like The Hairpin, Bitch Media, and Feministing failed to stay afloat some even before the pandemic. And in the absence of a compelling feminist movement, there's even more space for an increasingly loud and bold right-wing backlash to gain power. How could I be a feminist? I admire chivalry, I'm not angry, and I've yet to burn a bra. The pro-life campaigners leading the wave of abortion bans sweeping our country typically vote against policies that can improve the lives of mothers and their babies. And a 2019 poll found that pro-lifers are more likely to be hostile to women's rights. And in the aftermath of the vitriol directed at Amber Heard in her highly publicized defamation trial with Johnny Depp, women who accuse men of assault are becoming targets or they're increasingly afraid to come forward at all. I receive hundreds of death threats, thousands since this trial. So how is the feminist movement going to regroup, adapt, and redefine to meet this challenging moment? Promisingly, while we're not yet seeing a coherent, hopeful feminist movement, we are seeing evidence of a hunger for something new, different, and bold. Women are returning to feminist media coverage on publications like Jezebel, The 19th, and blogs and newsletters. In the aftermath of the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, reporting on women-centric political events is seeing a sharp rise in traffic. Popular celebrities are also embracing more overtly political expressions of feminism. I wanted to dedicate this next song to the five members of the Supreme Court who have showed us that at the end of the day, they truly don't give a sh about freedom. What's clear in these trends is that women are seeking something more concrete than the vaguely pro-female lifestyle brands of the 2010s or the performative, social media-centric outrage feminism of the Me Too movement. It's not enough to voice knee-jerk anger. We need instead to make solid, organized commitments to change. Now's the time to also become truly intersectional in terms of age, race, sexuality, and economic status. The mainstream version of feminism is, well, we're all women, so we're all fighting for the same thing and we all have the same struggle. That's not the case when you look at it through the framework of intersectionality because then you understand that different women have different struggles. And we are seeing some signs of this coming together in action. In Kansas, women cross party lines to join together in the vote to preserve abortion rights. The campaigners included all women, not just Democrats, not just the young, not just women in the abortion demographic, and it worked. 90-year-old Republicans voted to maintain the right. Reuters and Bloomberg called it a blueprint for abortion rights, but maybe it's a blueprint for feminism. Stop shouting into the void and start fighting together for clear, actionable goals. As Goldberg writes, it is perhaps inevitable that a movement that was the height of fashion in the last decade would start to seem passe in this one. That's how style works. But she also quotes writer Susan Faludi as saying, there's something cringeworthy about feminism even needing to be hip. The central question of feminism is, are women materially and politically disadvantaged and how to correct that? If that question is judged to be unhip, we're in trouble. If the mainstream feminism of the past decades is dying, that's because it's time for a new one. One that's a little less worried about being cool and popular and a lot more concerned with getting things done. Especially now, we must celebrate our art by protecting our right and our truths. Thanks for watching The Take. Make sure to subscribe and let us know what you want The Take on next.